Either she homeless or she got problems. That's the only reason why she run to a black man. I like him already. Now you wanna get nuts? Come on! Producer, director, writer, he is the ultimate filmmaker and bona fide foodie. You're listening to The Quintus Factor with Michael J. Arbue. Greetings and welcome to another episode of The Quiditas Factor with Michael J. Arbue. I am your host and what is Quiditas? Adriana, tell them what Quiditas is. Quiditas, Latin, the whatness of a thing, the essential nature of something, the quality that makes a thing what it is. Exactly. Quiditas is the whatness or essence of a thing or person. It basically makes you, you. And on this show, we interview people who are extraordinary, people who are mavericks in their field. And my next guest is an actor, producer, director. Uh, When you hear a story, not only will we be inspired, but I believe that if you are struggling, like I was a couple of years ago, that he will inspire you to just, you know, do what you want to do and make your dreams come true. I'd like to welcome to the show, Kevin Shenick. Kevin, welcome to the show. How we doing? Hey, how's it going? Going all right. Going okay. So let's start at the beginning. Tell me about Kevin Shinnick, the early years. Did you always want to become an actor? Yeah, I uh, I came out of the womb <laughs> knowing I wanted to be an actor. Um, and it was funny because that is something that I, I always, I didn't take it for granted, but I, I knew so early on that when people were like figuring out what they wanted to be, I always thought, well, I, I always knew this is what I wanted to be. Now, of course, you know, life throws you different things and changes different things, but and, and I've, I've changed that outcome or I've expanded it, I should say, because I, I think I always knew I wanted to be an entertainer. And uh, as a child, I think you gravitate towards acting first, if you're gonna be an entertainer, because you're, you know, I was, very fortunate that I, you know, I went to Old Mill Road School in Merrick, Long Island, and at the time they had a very extensive um, arts program. So every class did a play. There are always music concerts and dance concerts and everything. Uh, and I think that really did help shape or support my choices. But it's sad because I think by the time my brother went through, who's about six years younger than I am, I think they did away with a lot of that stuff. Um, but then, you know, you get, and I also remember that being elementary school, I remember in high school really wanting to be a filmmaker. And so I had all these interests, but they all seemed to emanate out from the idea of entertaining people, whether it was in front of the screen or behind the screen or writing or producing or directing or whatever it was. So, you know, certain, certain things are kind of chosen for you not chosen for you. There, there are certain breadcrumbs that are left and we can either take them and follow them or choose our own where we wanted to. And it just seemed that um, Hofstra University, where I went to college, as you know, was, um, uh, it seemed like the, the likely choice because my, my drama teacher at, at my high school had gone there. We went and did some Shakespeare scenes and we won, uh, you know, some competitions. I won Best Actor and... And later on, they offered me money. And I was like, well, this just seems like a given, you know. And then when I was there, they have a very great um, theater program and a a beautiful playhouse. Uh, And so it's funny how I thought about this recently, in fact, that I was like, wow, I really want to be a filmmaker really passionately. But I also want to be an actor. And and sometimes you figure out what's in front of me. And theater seemed to be the thing that was presenting itself most. So I went to the theater program. Hofstra had a a, a smaller film program, but it was the theater program that was really known for. Um, And so I went through that and had a great time. And, you know, I'm going to jump around. uh, I I don't mean to ramble on either. Mm -hmm. But it it was essentially like, I was very fortunate a year out of college to get uh, my first Broadway show as an actor. And it was only later that I started to think like, 
wow, uh, there are other things I wanted to do too. You know, I, I wanted to be more than just an actor, but I think that's where it starts. I, I knew I wanted to be an actor and I knew I wanted to be an entertainer. And then the question lies ahead of that in what form or medium. So that was my long winded answer to your short <laughs> question. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, it's funny. I, I mean, I, you probably know this, but, you know, uh, Francis Ford Coppola went to Hofstra and he was a big yeah, theater major as well. So it was like, you know, you were walking in the, in the steps of uh, greatness. But um, I heard a rumor that in the theater program in Calhoun, you actually did a, a play opposite Debbie Gibson. Is that true? <laughs> that, that is true. Debbie and I were in high school uh, together and we were both in Fiddler on the Roof. And sadly, for me anyway, if you look, uh, I think it was VH1s before they were rock stars, uh, were showing clips. And here's the show that, if I remember correctly, always just presented facts, didn't really comment, didn't have opinions. And yet all of a sudden they're like, but she wasn't always paired with Broadway talent. And they show this clip of she and I doing this, you know, junior high choreography. And the narrator even says like, don't rip her arm off, buddy, as I'm twirling her into the, you know, whatever. And I was like, hey, I was on Broadway. What are you talking about? <laughs> but um, that is the proof that we were, uh, we were in that together. Fiddler on the Roof. Wow, that's funny. Kevin, I have to tell you a funny story. I remember after college uh, flipping channels and all of a sudden I'm watching Where in Time is Carmen Santiago and there, there you were, there's your face. Uh, tell me about how you got that job. I remember I got my first agent because um, a woman I went to college with, uh, Karen Gonzalez, uh, was a friend of mine and she got a job at a commercial agency, Cunningham S. Scott Dapini. And she called and said, like, I think you'd be great here and, you know, you should come in and meet. And, and it was very fortunate she thought of me. So I came and I met and it was mostly a, a commercial agency uh, and voiceovers, but not, not theatrical acting or whatever. And so I had um, my agent's name was Carrie and she called me one day and said, hey, have you heard of the show Carmen San Diego? And I knew of it, of course. Mm. And she was either doing a continuation or spinoff of Where in Time is Carmen San Diego? And, you know, do you think you, you, know, you should go for it? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I, again, I'll say this many times. My motto is usually go with the door that opens. And I thought, well, I'll give it a shot. And um, I remember I, I went through like six or seven callbacks for that job. And I'll never forget, uh, she called me, my agent, and I was waiting and waiting and waiting. And I checked my voicemail and it's her saying, hey, it's Carrie give me a call. And I was like, Oh no. I said, after all this. So I called and I just said, what happened? And she said, well, you got it. And I was like, what? And it just blew my mind. And the, so the funny thing was I had lined up uh, to do some uh, regional theater. I think that summer. And I said to her, Oh wait, I just said, yes, I would do this play. And she's like, honey, this is a big deal. <laughs> She's like, you can let go of that little play and do this. And I was like, oh yeah, yeah, of course, of course. So uh, that came about, and like I said, it must have been like 95, 96, because uh, I'm pretty sure we shot it in 96 and it aired in 97. I think that's how it went, or started airing in 97. Wow. But that was a great experience. And even though I have, a, to this day, I've got goals and plans and things that I wanna do. But the best parts of my career so far are the things that have come out of left field that I didn't even know to wish for. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Carmen San Diego was one of them. It was like, who knew? You wow. know, did I wake up one day and say, I want to I wanna be a host of a, ga a kid's game show? No, I never did that. <laughs> but it wound up being a fantastic job and a lot of great memories. A lot of great friends were made there. And uh, I'm happy to this day that I did that. Wow. So now I, I get to the point where you get to work with legendary actor Tony Randall. How did that come about and how long did you work with him for? Well, it was Tony's, so there was, uh, Tony Randall had this country's first national actress theater, that's what it was called. So he really wanted to, to give this country one. So he created the National Actress Theater. But what was very generous of him was he created this like internship program for up and coming artists, uh, for actors, for directors and things like that. And so I remember, oh, that, I tell you, that, that first year out of college was brutal. 
uh, you know, I think I had, I had lost my girlfriend. I had lost my job. I think I was in a car accident, so I lost my means of transportation. I was living at home. It, it could not have been a worse situation. And my days are just filled with depression, I think. And I, I still remember we lived, my, there was a deli at the end of my corner where I grew up. And I remember literally my objectives each day were to go to go downtown, uh, go down the block, get a paper, get something for breakfast, come back, and just kill time until four o'clock when Oprah came on or something. You know what I mean? And that was, that was my day. I was like, well, I need to shake myself out of these doldrums. Because like, you know, when you go through these things, college and all your education, the entire time I was going through it, I was very firm. As I said to you, I came out of the womb knowing I want to be an actor. Go to school for it. The entire time, my dad is saying, eh, maybe you could pick something else up. Uh, and I was like, what? And so I became a double major of theater and communications. And he was like, I was thinking more like law. And I was like, well, no, I'm not going to be a lawyer. He's like, lawyers are a lot like actors. And I'm like, all right, stop with the hard sell. <laughs> but um, it was such, a, I, I was so defiant. And then that year, it all dawned on me. And I realized what he was saying. I was like, oh, my God, what, what do I do? I, I've been saying for so long I want to be an actor. And yet, I think Hofstra has changed at this point. In fact, I know it did because it was the year after I graduated, uh, there was a teacher who started a class specifically about the business of theater and acting. But when I was there, they didn't have that. So I was kind of released to the hound, but I was like, I, I, don't, know, I don't know what I'm doing. How do I even get into a play in, in the big time? And a friend of mine saw this um, announcement about this internship at, this, uh, at the National Actors Theater. So we went and we interviewed for it. And I'll still remember this day. I figured the important thing about this first round of interviews, I thought was just to be remembered more than anything else. It wasn't with Tony, it was just with somebody else. Mm -hmm. And I remember at the time, Tony Randall was the spokesman for Lay's potato, oh, what are Eagles, Eagles brand potato chips. <laughs> so I went out and this is such a crazy move. I don't know if I would have done this today, but I went to like the equivalent of Costco and I found the largest bag of Eagles brand potato chips that I could find. And they were like industrial size. It was like I was buying manure. It was that big. <laughs> and I smuggled it in this giant duffel bag. And I was in, in the middle of the interview. I said, look, I just want you to know I'm passionate about what I do. I'm passionate about this job. I said, I've read all about theater. I've studied. I've learned all about Tony Randall. And I said, I even read a book on how to subliminally sell yourself but I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna waste your time with that. At which point I took out this enormous bag of Eagle's brand potato chips and just opened it up and started eating. And fortunately, they found it entertaining and it was enough to get me to come back at least. And then through subsequent interviews, uh, I met Tony and it whittled down to about six of us. And the great thing about this internship was not only did you get on the ground floor and get to see all aspects of a Broadway play, but they also allowed you to audition for the plays as well, which as you know, is a huge boon because these are tough rooms to get into. Mm -hmm. And it was just my good fortune that uh, the first play that they were doing that year was Anton Chekhov's The Seagull. This play wound up being um, starring Ethan Hawke, Laura Linney, Tyne Daly, John Voigt, Tony Roberts, uh, a Marion Plunkett, who was a big theater name, also my friend Danny Burston, and it was like those guys and me. Wow! And I, I felt like I had won. Uh, I felt like I had won a walk on in an auction. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. But it was my it was my entry into that world, mm -hmm. and it was. And I've said this a hundred times, but it really was my graduate school because you're thrown into the thick of it. And the great thing about this play was. Everybody I mentioned are such wonderful actors, but they're all very different type of actors. You have theater actors and screen actors, and you know everybody had a different method or style. And I learned so much doing that. And so uh, that was my first Broadway show uh, ever. And that was thanks to Tony who gave me the opportunity to, to become an intern, which then allowed me to audition. And that's what got me in. And then just, Really, it was just subsequent plays that were going on that I auditioned for. But the thing that Tony gave me, which is invaluable, um, was 
the confidence. Here was someone that I loved because I was a huge fan of The Odd Couple and, and his movies and all those things. And I mean, you know, we're both from the East Coast every night, WPIX, 11 o'clock was The Odd Couple. You know, you couldn't miss it. Right. And so I like spent my life with him and then I get to meet him. And what was good about this was they also let you do, like the interns took it upon ourselves to do little showcases for Tony and anybody who was willing to sit and watch our little show. And I still remember Tony taking me aside and basically saying, in his opinion, that he thought I had what it took and that I was in the right profession and that I chose wisely and that I needed to keep pursuing it. And I, I tell you, that is, if you have to point to one thing, that was such a, uh, an inspirational boon to 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 know that someone that I idol, idolized and really respected thought they saw something in me at that time. Really, you know, we're living in a day and age where there's so many critics, especially online, and there's haters. And you know, those people existed before; they didn't have the voice they do now. But but to know that someone that I respected thought. I had something was enough for me to be like, well, then I'm going to continue doing this. I'm going to keep at it because I want to keep at it. But his words always helped at, you know, 3 a.m. when you're having those waking up in the middle of the night being, what am I doing? Am I doing the right thing? Or what, what should I be doing? And it's stuff like that that really put me on my path. Wow. That's amazing. And it's so, it's so funny because um, I was in theater in high school, but not, you know, I always wanted to, to like direct movies. I had a friend who, had a video camera and I never had access to a video camera. And, you know, that was like our toy. I'm like, Oh, can we use this? And he's like, as long as you don't break it. And I would sit there yeah. and play with this yeah. video camera, like every day making little movies. But I, I was also in theater. And I said, I think that I loved about theater is that because you had to rehearse every day going towards the show, you always became like a family with the people yeah. that you work with. And, um, and then, you know, you were kind of sad after, you know, the shows are over because you spend all these months practicing and getting to know the person. So yeah. I wanted to, uh, to, yeah, to tap your brain a little bit about that. With every performance that you did, like, um, how, how well did you get to know these other actors and, and how um, insightful were they to you? Well, as you said, you, you know, you're thrown into the thick of it. So you can't help but know these people really well because you're you're under like sometimes intense circumstances and you know long hours long weeks on end uh and that's what's so interesting in our, about this business is you get to know someone so deeply and so fast and so fast and furious and then in most cases you never see them again you know um my wife always jokes because i've known her forever that i always seem to be able to keep at least one good friend from every show or, or production i've done so so that i i have staken a little bit here and there but um but i did get to know everybody very well um you know i'm just trying to think a, a funny story that came from the seagull was uh, so i mentioned the cast and john voight being one of them and John and I became very close during this production. It ran, I think it ran in like six months or something. And so every day we're spending together and, you know, and, and he and I became friends. And this person I'm going to mention wasn't the person we know her to be now uh, because we were both, this is many, many years ago. But he said to me one day, hey, my daughter's coming to town. Would you like to take her to dinner? And I was like... Yeah, sure, whatever. So as a result, I've gone on a date with People Magazine's Sexiest Woman Alive, Angelina Jolie. Wow. <laughs> back, in, uh, back in the early 90s when we were both starting out. And uh, I don't think she even had anything that had come out yet. I think she had filmed some things that we spoke about, but nothing I don't believe had come out. So it was just, it's, it was more surreal in hindsight, you know? Um, but like... I, I mentioned, you know, Danny Burstyn. He's he's been nominated for a Tony like six times. He was in the Seagull. I still talk to him very regularly. Um, you know, we're Facebook friends. Uh, I have a lot of friends from, like I said, from each production. You just there's someone you click with usually that you're like, oh hey. And and the great thing about it was Tony became a friend. Uh, he wasn't just a mentor. He became someone who was a, a very important part in my life. And in addition to really just supporting me with confidence, he was there as like a, 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 a as a guidance. 
you know, to the point where when I finally did my own independent film, um, and you know, you know, you've done it. So it's like, you know, you're doing this from scratch, you got your own budget, you're like, what, how are we gonna put one foot in front of the other? My brother and I really wanted to do this. So we were like, so we rented, we bought a camera and we were gonna figure out how to do this. And so I thought, well, you know what? There's a role in here that would be really great for Tony. If he would agree to do it, I think that would be a great way to start this because then you could say to everybody, hey, are you interested in doing this? Look, there's no money, there's no this and there's no that, but it does have Tony Randall in it. And so I was very nervous about asking him, but I called him up and I said, would you consider doing a part? And he said, send it to me. And I said, all right. So I sent it to him and then like three days later, I wish I still had answering machines that had tape on them. I just remember hearing, beep, Kevin is Tony. I like it. I like it a lot. I'll do it. <laughs> that was a great impersonation. Wow, that's fantastic that Tony Randall was in your first film. Let me take a step back. Let me ask you, how do you juggle your career and your home life? How did you, you meet your wife? Um, so uh, my wife and I both currently belong to the Ensemble Studio Theater in New York. But uh, at the time, I had three roommates that I lived with downtown. Um, and my friend Heather was one of them. And Heather belonged to Ensemble Studio Theater, as did my now, as did my wife, Eileen. And so Eileen and Heather would drive up to their summer conference in the Catskills. And instead of driving all the way home to Manhattan and then further on to New Jersey, where she lived, she stopped and spent the night. And, and we kind of hit it off. Yeah. And we were like, oh, this is kind of amazing. But she was in a relationship at the time. And so it didn't happen. And then a year later, the exact same circumstances, uh, she was driving the van again, instead of going all the way back to her Jersey, she stayed over again. This time it, it took. <laughs> so <laughs> that was, that was many years ago, but, uh, but you know, I, I'm sure it helps too that she and I are both in the business. Mm -hmm. My wife is also a writer producer. Uh, when we first met, I was just an actor and she was just a director of theater. Mm -hmm. So, um, we had that in common. But then, of course, as you, you know, what you get older and things change and life throws you different things and you experiment with different things, we both started picking up writing. So mm -hmm. it's fun, although we've never worked on anything together officially, we're always bouncing ideas off each other or what do you think of this or I need to break this, can you help me or whatever. So it is kind of a collaboration as a family. Uh, even though it, there's nothing in the credits on IMDb that says we work together, we work on together on all sorts of things. Wow, that's amazing. How about you? Um, how, do you how do you guys do it? Well, my, it's funny. In the beginning, my wife just thought, oh, that's just this thing he does, you know? And uh, it's kind of like I, we, I've mm -hmm. had a love loss with, the, with my career because with my career, I would moved immediately to California right after college and couldn't make it, right. didn't know anybody, and hated it. So I it's left, tough. yeah, so I, tough. I left California, came back to New York, and got into the indie film scene there. And I was right. a sound guy, and I was really good at syncing the picture and sound together. So that became my job. So anytime somebody you know did a film, the dailies would come in to do art, and then they would rush it to me, and I would physically sync the picture up with the clap, and then I would burn them into the sound and picture and you know hang wow. them up in bins and that's how uh they used to edit films back then so at, yeah. at one point yeah. that was doing really well and then around 2001 the bottom kind of fell out of the industry and no one was using 16 millimeter anymore everything started to go digital and you had to relearn everything so <laughs> Uh, so oh, I went from, God, I know. <laughs> so I went from, from yeah. like this big fish, uh, like doing sound work to all of a sudden having to start over again. And so like we've had ups <laughs> no. and downs with that. So like when my wife, like I was lucky enough that I, I had a, always had like a side job doing something. And then when there was a film project that came up, I was always fortunate enough to like take some time off and do a project. Yeah. That's so good. I would go back and forth, but she always thought of that as, as a, like, oh, that's just your thing. You know, you'll do a film, you'll make some money, and then you'll go back to your real job that has benefits. And, <laughs> you know, so it was kind of like this crazy thing. But um, right. um, I would like, as following your career, and that's another thing that I wanted to, to talk to you about, 
So like after you you did all this theater and um, you're you're coming up as an actor, I wanted to ask you like how did you get into writing, and when did you make that move to LA? Because your experience was ten times better than mine. Well, it wasn't. It wasn't. I had a we, I had a, a experience sort of like yours. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I guess it was right when I was doing Carmen San Diego. I said to Eileen, I think I need to go to LA to try LA for a little bit, which I, I think everybody should. So, you know, just so you know it, if you're in this business, you need to figure that out. So I came out here for like three months and it was dreadful. You know what I mean? It was, I mean, I shouldn't say dreadful. It was rough. Yeah. I wound up getting, I, I can't say dreadful because I did do, I had a very, very small part in Larry David's movie, Sour Grapes, which occurred after Seinfeld, but before Curb Your Enthusiasm. We did this feature film called Sour Grapes, and I got an incredibly small role in it. But what's so funny is that that movie was about these characters, and one of the guys was an actor on in the movie on a show much like Friends. So what they did was they put us together and like filmed our mini friends. And I was like the Chandler on that version of friends. But when you look at everybody else who was in there, you know, my friend Meredith Salinger was in there, you know, uh, I forget the woman from sex in the city was in there. It's all, it's all these great people who've gone on to things that we were all these small little roles in this, in this, uh, in this film. But the thing was, um, it was rough, you know, and then, as I said to you, I was just an actor and Wiley was just a director of theater. So when we came back, now we're living in Manhattan again and we both have an interest in writing. And I start to, um, I forget in what order it came, but I also started doing a lot of voiceovers. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, my brother had worked for Viacom in like the post-production area. And he called me one day and he's like, you know, they're looking for a voiceover for like to be the voice of Nickelodeon, you know? And so I was like, all right. So I, I set my audition tapes in and stuff and, and I wound up getting it. So I was the guy for a couple of years who was like coming up next SpongeBob followed by the Rugrats or whatever, you know? <laughs> so I was in there, but while I'm recording this, you know, I'm cracking jokes and we're making the engineers and the producers laugh because you know, that's what we do. We we're, we're looking to have a good time no matter where we are. And they say to me at one point, Hey, would you ever want to be a writer here? And I was kind of like, and and the and the funny thing is, I it, it was such an opportunity, and yet there was so much I wanted to do still that I thought it was that old thing of like, oh, if I take a job, I'm not going to be able to do this play and this movie. And this is right before I was doing the movie I talked about with Tony and all this stuff, and. I said, no. And then I went off and I did a bunch, I did the play, I did the movie. I actually wound up doing, uh, it was just a different story um, uh, about, uh, I did the, the first ever theatrical version of Spider-Man at Radio City Music Hall. And I was so broke that I was like, what am I gonna do? I mean, we were so in the red that I was like really starting to panic. And God love them, they came around again and said, are you sure you don't want to be a writer? And I, I, I really see it was divine intervention because there's no other way I think I would have said yes, except I was so desperate that I said yes. So whenever I talk to people, I always say, I know it's an expression starving artist, but you don't have to fall into that mold. I'm not saying you won't. I'm just saying that you don't have to make a choice to be, I'm going to be a starving artist. I would say you sometimes money enables you to do the things you want to do, even though as an artist, you're like, that's death. I won't be able to do anything, you know, Mm -hmm. flexibility and the, you know, the economic freedom to do plays and go off and write. And so that was kind of my first foray into writing that. And it dovetailed with that Spider-Man show that I did. Um, And we both at the time, my wife and I both started writing. And I remember thinking, like, how are we going to get back to California? Because I felt that's where I needed to be. And yet I know Eileen hated it so much here that I thought, oh, this is, how am I going to do this? She hated it. And then lo and behold, she broke in first. She got a job on uh, that HBO series, Big Love. Uh-huh. So she, uh, she came out to California 
And the problem was we had, because it was such a rough time that when we were out here for that year, I thought, I don't want to drop everything and follow to California only to find us in the same boat if they decide HBO is not going to, you know, it was just a pilot at that point. Mm -hmm. So it's like, what if we drop everything and go and then we're stuck out there? So for two years, we, or maybe a year and a half, no, about two years, we were apart and traveling back and forth like twice a month. You know, uh, at some point I talked to Nickelodeon and said, hey, could you give me a leave of absence? And they said, well, just work for us, but from California for like three months and then come back. And I was like, all right. So again, they were just super supportive. So we went back and forth and back and forth. And finally, uh, because HBO does devote a lot of time to development, they finally said, all right, it's going to series. And that's when I was like, all right, I'm, I'm officially moving out. And so when I moved out here, I had the, the security of still having the Nickelodeon job, which I was doing remotely. But the day it was up, I, I worked with them for a year from California, but literally the day it was up was the day I got my job working on Robot Chicken. And I had gotten that because in the interim, while working my job, I also started working a lot of spec scripts, which is something you needed at that time, you know, to show your samples. I say that because nowadays, I don't know if people want spec scripts anymore. They kind of want original pilots. They want your flavor. They want to know what you're going to bring to the table. Right. So um, I happen to have this Family Guy script that was doing very well for me as a sample. And if you know anything about specs and samples, because I wrote a Family Guy, they're not going to give it a Family Guy because, you know, then there's like, hey, you, if, if I ever accuse them of stealing my ideas. But Robot Chicken was similar enough that they gave it to Seth and them. And they really liked it. So they brought me in. And Seth and I hit it off tremendously, as I did with all the other writers there. And that kind of launched the writing career to be honest wow. that's great that's fantastic so but, I mean, you know, it did have its false starts like you the la la was is not always a welcoming place at first <laughs> you know what i mean yeah uh, it took two tries it took us two tries so don't feel bad wow that's funny yeah my wife's like oh, are we ever gonna go out there and i'm like i don't know they kind of hate new york. i don't know if you got this when i first went there i found out they hated new yorkers i remember i went on this job <laughs> interview and I'd gotten there like, I don't know, 45 minutes early. And the, the, the interview was supposed to be at 3.30 and I'd gotten there at 2. And they're like, oh, we weren't expecting you till 4. I'm like, oh, but my interview is at 3.30. And then she goes, you must be from New York. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. Oh, my God. That's and hilarious. And I'm like, okay. That's hilarious. And so it was like, it was kind of this laid back kind of, um, you know, I, I found that people from California were more laid back than people from New York. Like we kind of want it now. And, yes. you know, we're on these schedules. Yes. And I found that, that, that as I went back and forth, uh, visiting friends or doing little odd jobs, I'm like, all right, are we going to go? And they're like, no, we're going to sit here for a little while and eat some lunch. And we're going to, and I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> I'm used to like moving really fast and skipping lunch. <laughs> I know. It is definitely a different pace. So now you're working on Robot Chicken, and I have to ask, because I don't know anyone else who won an Emmy. How, how did that feel that, you know, you're working on this show, and all of a sudden you're at the Emmys and you win? Tell me about that moment. I mean, it, I, I'm not going to lie, it's pretty amazing. I mean, <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't, I'll be honest with you, it doesn't change much. It's not like, right. oh, I have an Emmy, everybody's going to give me jobs. Right. But it was, it was such a... Because we, we love working on that show, and it was such a great time. But I don't think, I don't think we thought we were going to win. Right. You know what I mean? It was kind of like, oh, this is great. In fact, we, uh, we had been nominated the year before and didn't win then either. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was kind of like, you know, it's a fun night. You get dressed up. You go on this dinner and everything afterwards. So I think that's the way we looked at it. It was like, all right, we'll have a fun night. And when they read it, it was like, what? You know, <laughs> it was surreal. I still remember Erica Christensen, who was a friend at the time, was also the presenter. And she, uh, and Seth was up there with her. And he was like, it's us. We won. And that's the other thing. Because Seth was the presenter for our own category, I thought, there's no way we're winning. They wouldn't give it to him to say, hey, I won. And so when, I think all our jaws just dropped. Wow. So, uh, so, yeah, it was, it was a surreal experience, and it was really wonderful. Um, uh, because it is what it is. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's something yeah. you hear about. It's something you can visualize. But, again, truthfully, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't 
there aren't that many doors that opens, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's more of a, a nice thing. Okay. All right. So what's something people seem to misunderstand about you? Um, I think sometimes people confuse uh, nice with weak mm. or pleasant with, uh, um, I don't want to say safe because I am safe, but, but I, I think sometimes if I'm the funny light guy, mm. they think, oh, well, he's the funny light guy. He can't be taken seriously or, but I think, I, I think my personality, it's, it's worked to my advantage because I think my personality disarms a lot of people or I shouldn't say disarm, it puts them at ease. Mm -hmm. And then they're surprised once they get to know me that I'm also ambitious and get the work done and can deliver. You know what I mean? Right. So it's, it's, I mean, maybe this is my, maybe I'm putting on there, but I think I've, I've discovered that people are always a little taken back when you realize, when they realize I'm more than whatever they, you know, thought I was or something like that. So that's my only thing. And I tell people too, it's like, this, this can be a very rough business and there's a lot of mean people and there's a lot of cutthroat in it. And I agree with that, but I don't think you need to be that kind of person necessarily. I think right. you can get just as much done being a nice person. In fact, it, I think it just helps the world go around. You know what I mean? I sleep easy at night because I haven't stabbed anybody in the back. Right. <laughs> but, uh, but I can still get the job done, I guess is what I'm trying to say. You mm -hmm. know, the way I view it, there's a lot of people who burn bridges and they're not fun to work with. But, you know, if anything, what I've learned is I, I just always try and be someone that people want to work with mm -hmm. because that's what is kind of the key to longevity sometimes is at some point you're going to, you know, you have friends who have shows or anybody who has shows is going to call up and ask about your last show. Were they a good person to work with, a bad person to work with? I never get that when people are real pains in the necks at work. Cause it's like, you, you know, right. That this is your reference to your next gig too. So it's not like, don't burn your bridge here, right. you know? And it's not like I'm going out of my way to be extra nice or anything. I, it's as simple as treating people the way I want to be treated, you know? And, mm. and I've been treated well in my life and I, I try and treat people well in life. So I think stuff like that goes a long way. Yeah. Tell me about a person that truly touched your heart and, and how they inspired you to be your best self. So uh, going back to the Tony Randall of it all, uh, those years were very important to me because for obvious reasons, like I said, Tony is this larger than life character who kind of puts, takes me under his wing and gives me the courage and the, you know, the inspiration to go on. But what was really eye opening at that time too was um, getting to do these plays now, I mentioned a lot of celebrities in these plays, but there are also a lot of people in this play, these plays who are not celebrities. And when I got involved, I was in my early 20s. And I became, you talk about staying friends, I'm still friends with all of them. There was an older crowd of, of actors who, I guess they were in their 50s at the time, because a lot of them are in their 80s now, um, who kind of opened my eyes to the idea that you can be a working actor, you know? The answer is not nothing or Brad Pitt. There's a happy medium. Right. And now that may be stating the obvious, but I think to someone like myself coming out of college and you've got stars in your eyes and you want to do all this, it was great working with celebrities, but almost more important to see the people who worked regularly, who did wonderful jobs, who usually you would recognize from some small part in a movie somewhere, because they're all paying their bills and doing what they can, um, but who were there doing just as good work and who, that was the real eye-opening moment for me, which gave me the confidence to be like, okay, it's not all or, or nothing. There, I, can, if I treat this as a career. It's not a keep my fingers crossed and shoot for the moon and hope to become a movie star. It's, no, you put your nose to the grindstone, you rehearse, you take acting class, you work hard, and there is a payoff. And these are staples, you know, in not only the Broadway community, but like I said, they make the television rounds, they make the theater rounds. And 
you know, in a sense, you know, when I do guest stars and stuff on television shows, I'm reminded of these guys because I look up to them so much and they're not always the stars. They're not always the ones that you stop on the street to be like, oh my God, but they're just as important. And, and they've all become good friends in this particular instance. And they have always been such inspirations to me. Yeah. It's funny. I, I joke around like every time we watch uh, a show, like you said, I, I see friends who are doing guest spots. And I remember, <laughs> I remember seeing you on Rizzoli and Isles. And um, yes. I, I, I tell him, my, uh, he can't be the killer. He's too nice of a guy. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's so true. <laughs> that is so true. I know. I, I, uh, I also did, I think it was a, a Without a Trace or something. And my friend texted me like, if you're the killer, I will never forgive you. And I was like, no, I wasn't. I wasn't, you know? It was just, it's very funny how that worked out. I, I joke around because uh, my friend Larry, I think he remembered you because he, he was he went to school with me at Post, and uh, I think he saw you in something. And he's like, "Does Kevin age?" I'm like, "No, he's an immoral. Don't you know that?" <laughs> 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 yeah, I trade my soul for certain things. So I'll admit it. <laughs> so it's funny because I'm like I'm like I said I think Kevin's going to get these roles because he he doesn't age. He's got the same look. Like I, I think. <laughs> Maybe he paints in gray hair just to make us feel good. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll tell you, I have a friend, I have a number of friends, obviously, who are, who are, you know, on the other side of the camera. And they'll, like the other day, there was one, a pilot, and there's like, you know, my age. And I, I called him, I said, hey, my agent wants to submit me for this. Am I right for it? Should I bother? And he's like, I'll be honest with you, you don't look that age. He's like, I, I, I can't give it to you because you're not. And I was like, oh, come on. <laughs> so now I, I don't get the younger roles because when you put me next to those people, those younger kids, I don't look that young. But, but I apparently don't look my age either. So I'm stuck in the middle somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Outside of acting, what are you curious about right now? You know, um, it always goes, I, I love history. And it goes back to where in time is Carmen San Diego. I mean, I loved history before then, but that really kind of focused it for me, mm -hmm. especially now during Corona. It's so funny because I, I found lately a lot of solace in Shakespeare, not necessarily his works, but his life. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's because he lived through a plague or two, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. Was still able to churn out you know, King Lear and some other things, but there's a number of good uh, books, uh, The Year of Lear and things like that, that I'm, I'm reading now because it, it does bring me some comfort to know that uh, we, we, we do go through these. History does repeat itself. We've been through this before and we've come out the other side. So I think history is always something that entertains me because it brings me comfort, but there are so many amazing things that happen in history. So when you're trying to like, that's why I, I always, for the most part, up until recently, I read mostly nonfiction because I always want to learn something. You know, I want to put out a book and be like, all right, I'm smarter because, but I also find that a lot of great ideas for television, movies, plays, whatever, come from these nuggets of like, who knew such and such happened? Or there's a little story there, you know? I mean, now they got whole industries of people who do nothing but, search the the newspapers and magazines for stories and whatever so they can get on it but but history for me is always a, a place that i continually go back to wow so now i've been building up to this question um uh -oh. you know because you're, you're telling me about writing uh, how did you land being one of the writers in the star wars saga and <laughs> and and um did you actually get to meet um, um george lucas at one point I did. I did. Um, I met George through, ultimately it was through Robot Chicken. You know, we had done the Star Wars specials. Mm -hmm. And so we had gone up there. We would we get to a point where every time we did one, we would go up to Skywalker Ranch and we'd premiere it in his theater and they'd have a party. And, and it was just it, it, disgustingly wonderful. Um, and then, you know, George, I think, looked at us having fun with Star Wars at Robot Chicken. He saw Seth MacFarlane having fun with it at, at Family Guy. And I think he was like, hey, I, I want to have fun with Star Wars. <laughs> so he created, he had this idea to make a Star Wars sitcom, uh, an animated family sitcom. So I was one of the writers uh, fortunate enough to go up there for a number of weeks to work on this, um, which was called, wound up being called Star Wars Detours. 
Uh, but unfortunately, we shot, or, or I should say we shot because it's animated, but we, we completed like two seasons and we wrote three seasons and then George sold the company to Disney. Oh. <laughs> and I think at that point, all, ro- all roads led to episode seven and they were only interested in, in that. Mm-hmm. And I think they didn't air our stuff because of that. And to, if I'm just being honest, I think during that void, I think maybe the Lego Star Wars came, star, you know, the Lego stuff came in right. and that kind of filled that comedy animated void. So right. it's out there somewhere. It's, you know, I don't know if we'll ever see the light of day, but, um, but what's funny is, so I, I got to know George doing detours, Star Wars detours, and literally just sitting right next to him for a number of weeks, which was surreal because I, I always say I'm happy it was as long as it was because for at least two weeks I couldn't hear a thing he was saying because I just couldn't get my mind just kept saying you made Star Wars you made Star I he wasn't even (laughs) real to me wow and then finally it starts to you start to calm down and you're like oh all right he's just just a man he's just a man (laughs) you know and and so I was lucky enough to do that the the getting to write the novel was kind of a parallel thing um you know, again, I think it goes to being the kind of person people want to, people want to work with. I, uh, I also write comic books. And very early on, I think I, I wrote a, a Batman sketch for uh, Robot Chicken. And one of the DC Comics editors reached out to me saying how he loved Batman. He loved this sketch. And yeah, I think it's happened at Comic-Con. We started talking. And he, he was like, would you ever want to write a Batman comic? And I was like, don't, you just can't throw that out there. Yes, of course I would. So he gave me an opportunity. I wrote my first Batman comic. And subsequently, you know, you make relationships with people. And he moved around. And uh, at one point, he moved to Lucasfilm Publishing. And a couple of years ago, he called me and said, would you be interested in writing a, um, a Star Wars uh, children's book? And I said, you know, I, I, I had then my daughter was five years old. So I thought this might be a good in for her for Star Wars. So I said, yes, but I also have a caveat. I said, would you keep me in mind for, you know, more for adult stuff? And he was like, yeah, we didn't know you were interested. And I was like, who, who, who wouldn't be interested? <laughs> so, um, so uh, after we were in, we were at Comic-Con promoting what then became Chewie and the Porgs, which is the, my Star Wars children's book. And we had brunch and I basically was like, look, what, what kind of things are you looking for in a novel? And he gave me some rough ideas, you know, and I forget if you know it, but it's a three hour train ride from San Diego to Los Angeles. And I literally said goodbye to him, got on that train. And when I got out in LA, I, I emailed him this lengthy outline that I had already uh, took three hours to write. Cause I just, it just poured out of me this idea that I thought would be really cool. Um, and for most part, that is still what Force Collector wound up being. And that's wow. how I got to write that novel, Force Collector. Wow, that's amazing. Now, I, funny, I bumped into you at Comic-Con, and you told yes. this, this funny story that your story was so close to the new movie that they made you rewrite the whole thing. Can you tell me about that? Yes, absolutely. Uh, they, you know, so I pitched this, and my publisher loves it. He's like, we just got to get it greenlit. So it takes a year for them to green light it. And he calls me, I still remember, he calls me, he calls me in like April saying, uh, I think this is gonna get green lit in May. I said, this is fantastic. He's like, but here's the thing. I said, what? I need it in three months. And I was like, three months? I was like, you're asking the impossible. Forgetting, of course, that's exactly what Luke says to Yoda when he tells him you know, how to train. I was like, oh, my own, my own Star Wars where it's coming back to haunt me. So truth be told, I kill myself to, to get a first draft in realistically four months. And right before Christmas of that year, they call me. This is a year before episode nine. And I said, what? They said, well, somehow you inadvertently wrote a huge section of episode nine, which is the movie that was in development at the time. And I, I was flabbergasted. And I, my first thought was, well, you got me working on the wrong gig. I should be writing the movie then. Uh, and we all laughed and then they were like, yeah, anyway, you got to change yours. And I was like, oh, you're kidding me. So I had to, uh, I had to go back in and fortunately my uh, force collector is kind of a a road trip type story. So Mm -hmm. it didn't change the arc of the character at all, but I had a, I had to curtail some of the places he went and some of the things he found. 
but I thought it was kind of kind of fun that it, that I was on the same page as JJ and all those guys, uh, mm. but also a little bummed that <laughs> I had to go back and re-break this thing. Wow. But it all worked out in the end, so it was all good. That's amazing. And, and uh, you're still married because the book came out on your wife's birthday, right? <laughs> it did. You remember, yes. She was so sick of hearing about this. I mean, I swear to God, I... I, I'm sure every therapy session I ever had for a year was about that book. I'm sure I talked to my wife incessantly about that book. And then when she thought it was all going to come to an end, I was like, hey, guess what it comes out on your birthday? <laughs> She's like, oh, it has to even overshadow that. Thanks a lot. But, uh, but it was a great success for me. So I'm very happy that I did that. Wow. So now I have to ask, what's, what's next for Kevin Chinnick? What are you working on now? You know, I got a, a bunch of things in development for television. I can't talk about it, but I just sold a show to a, 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 a company that I'm happy with that you would know. Um, but again, I can't talk about that. However, I can mention I have both a Spider-Man comic and a Flash comic coming out. When I say a comic, I mean a run on it. Um, so there'll be a couple of issues on each that I'm really excited by. So that those should start coming out. I know Flash, I think, will start coming out in September. Um, so I've got that going on and I always, you know, I always got my fingers in a bunch of pies because you never know what's going to go and what's going to fall by the wayside. So I throw a lot at the wall and mm-hmm. hope to see what sticks. But wow, those, uh, but I definitely have a busy year ahead of me. Uh, what's the best compliment you've ever received? Oh my gosh. Uh, maybe when Michael Arboway said, would you do my podcast? <laughs> <laughs> I thought, wow, I must have made it. <laughs> so that was a good job of it. Um, I, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's, it's tough. I will say hearing George Lucas laugh out loud at one of my lines in, uh, uh, in one of my sketches was a compliment without really being put into words. You know what I mean? That was a mm-hmm. moment that I was like, oh, that's cool. He found that really funny. And I wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but I don't know. Uh, honestly, when all is said and done, I remember being at a hotel when my daughter was young and I'd spend the, you know, we were there for a number of days because my wife was working on the set and some man ran into me. He said, I just want to tell you something. You're a really good dad. And I was like, oh, that really meant a lot. I was like, I really, I really appreciate that. <laughs> Especially because, you know, she was like three at the time. We were just hanging out. It was like we were a, a honeymooning couple. We were always at the restaurant. We were dancing on the dance floor. We were at the <laughs> pool. We were getting nachos at the bar. You know, we were just round the clock, she and I. So for him to say that made me feel really good. Oh, that's fantastic. Are there any funny stories or memories that you want to talk about? This, like, you know, something that pops out that, you know, the audience might like? I will say, look, uh, uh, I don't know if it's funny or not funny, but, but you know, we live in this time where so there are so many critics online and, and everybody puts their best foot forward, you know? And I like to give everybody credit for that, you know, trying to get off the ground and just do something because it's very easy to stay at home and do nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, when I look at George uh, Lucas, you know, I think I've said this to you before, where it's like, here was an independent experimental filmmaker. You know, he tries different things. Uh, he succeeds a lot, which is, weird that when he doesn't we really vilify him and mm-hmm. you know and 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 is he not really succeeding or is he you know or is he succeeding in what he wanted to do you know it's that question of is he giving us the movie we want or is he giving us the movie we need if you go back to his movies every one of them offered us something different that we hadn't seen before right um and i think of tony i think of tony trying to do uh, good by the country and giving them a national theater. Mm-hmm. And yet I still, I still remember uh, being on stage for uh, the seagull and a lot of stuff happens and people run by and Tony Roberts has this funny line of people are boring after this whole commotion had run off. And one day he says, people are boring. And someone in the front row yells, not this boring. And we, I, we were just so shocked at this person's gall, but also their honesty that for whatever reason, he was not enjoying that production. So I don't know, it's a funny story, but it's, it's, it's always sticks in my 
in my mind of like, you know, we're all just trying to do our best here. So give us a little, give us a break, you know? Well, before I let you go, what's one of the yeah. most important things you've learned in your life? And, and like, what, what advice would you give for anyone who is trying to make it in this business now? You know, I guess what I've learned is don't lead with fear. Um, when I was doing that independent film that I did that Tony agreed to do, I was reminded time after time after time to just ask. Because if I sat there and thought, oh, what are the chances Tony Randall's going to say yes to my little movie, I might not have asked him. And yet he said yes. People I met with who donated their time said yes. I remember getting a voiceover gig down, I can't remember the name of the studio, but it was down in Soho. And I walked in and it's this enormous loft in Soho that looked almost residential, but they had a recording studio there. You know, the lounge had couches and a kitchen. And, you know, we've all seen them. Mm -hmm. And it was enormous. And I thought, oh my God, this would be perfect for the apartment of one of my characters who's supposed to be very rich and, you know, much more well off than I am. I wonder if I can shoot here. I thought, what are the, I don't even know these people. <laughs> and I asked them, mm -hmm. and the guy was like, yeah, I'll give you the keys on a Friday, you give it back to me on a Monday. And <laughs> there was no reason he needed to do that. I, don't, I didn't know who this guy was, mm -hmm. you know? And I thought, there are so many times I'm reminded, just ask, because you're never gonna know unless you put yourself out there. And really, what's the harm? You know, mm -hmm. what are you gonna get? At the very least, you're gonna get a no. And then you go to somebody else until you get a yes. But if you never ask and you never try, you're never going to know. And, and like I said, sometimes I think I've had the career I had because I've been too ignorant to know it shouldn't have been, I don't want to say easy because it hasn't been easy. Because I, I, I was too ignorant to know it shouldn't be that possible. Kevin, thank you for the great stories and advice. Uh, end the show for us, will you? Hey, this is Kevin Shinnick, and I'm listening to The Quiditas Factor. Hey guys, before you go, if you like the show, please follow us on Facebook and Instagram. And for more information on me or the show, you can go to MikeArboe.com. That's M-I-K-E-A-R-B-O-U-E-T.com. Buy some merch, check out my books, see what movies I'm working on. And thank you for listening. Tune in next week for an all new episode of The Quiddicons Factor.